Uh, hello and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the May edition of the Plains and Prairie Potholes LCC Science Webinar. I'm Dean Granholm, the PPP LCC Science Coordinator and your host. Um, the webinar is scheduled to go for an hour, and we do expect some time for questions at the end. So at that time, if you'll just please uh, raise your question either on the phone or via the chat boxes, uh, we'll get to them as we can. We are, as Rick mentioned earlier, we are recording this webinar, and we do plan to post it on our website within a day or so after we get done. Uh, finally, I guess I'll remind everybody to please put your phones on mute to minimize background noise during the presentation. Um, with that, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Pete Bauman, Range Field Specialist with, the, with South Dakota State University Extension. Uh, Pete earned two degrees at South Dakota State, and he followed that up with 14 years at the Nature Conservancy, where he focused on land management, including prescribed fire and grazing and restoration. He returned to SDSU in his current role in extension in 2012. He joins us today to deliver his presentation, South Dakota's Undisturbed Native Land Inventory, a new model for Great Plains land assessment and conservation prioritization. Pete, welcome to the webinar, and please take it away. All right, well, thank you, Dean. Thanks, Rick, for inviting me to uh, share with you the the um, results to date of the work that we're doing here at South Dakota State University. Um, I'm not going to do a lot of lead in here. Uh, I've got that kind of built in throughout the presentation, so I think we'll just go ahead and, and launch into it. Um, well, I thought we would until I hit. <laughs> okay. Uh, my slides. Let me just think. Hold on, everyone. Let's see what's going on here. Okay. Um, we know that the Great Plains were shaped by, you know, large forces, fire, climate, and grazing, and the interactions of those, you know, for for thousands of years. Um, we uh, and under under previous management, it was basically the same for for quite a long time, for several millennia. But now we're under new management, and uh, for the last couple hundred years, things have looked just a little bit different. Um, under new management, the surface resources were uh, utilized, you know, with an intensity that we ha that hadn't been previously seen, and certain forces such as fire were suppressed um, across the landscape. Now, the effect of that initial change hard to assess, but just recognizing that that it occurred is important. Um, sorry about the skipping on the slides there, um, but also with the with that era, obviously, of settlement, we started to see some use of subsurface resources, you know, primarily agricultural um, practices. And technology has driven that, that ability to change the land dramatically, um, you know, for the better part of a couple centuries now. And we continue to see, you know, advances, which I'm going to discuss here in a little bit. But it has shaped our home. You know, we all live on the Great Plains. And this next series of photos is just uh, kind of a reminder of what we see when we when we encompass, the, especially the northern plains, agriculture, um, industry, etc. And my slides are advancing on their own here, um, so bear with me. Um, animal feeding operations, dairies, etc. Um, you know, fuel production is a is a big not sure. I'm sorry, folks. This is just running away from me here. Um, energy production, etc. And like I said, technology has allowed us to advance our land use um, agenda by quite a great deal. So not only you know in techniques and equipment, chemicals, genetics, and of course data. And what where data comes into play um, primarily in agriculture, you know we've. The, the, with the advent of precision ag, we have got a mountain of data available um, at our disposal for how we understand land, how we how we can manipulate land. I'm sorry, it's jumping ahead again. Um, and you know, we also have it on the scientific side, on our side, um, as far as what we can learn about land um, with the data and the, the tools and resources that we have available. So today I'm going to focus on, within the... Um, the Plains and Prairie Potholes LCC, the kind of the southeast corner, uh, which is basically eastern South Dakota and southwest Minnesota, and the work we've been doing in that landscape 
in regard to understanding more about our land as it is today. <clears throat> now, we know that um, over the, most of the last several years, we've had many reports come out on land use and land use um, and land change. Um, some of them got a lot of press. Uh, Wright and Wimberly paper out of SDSU in uh, 2013 was, was a big one. But they all basically draw on the same set of resources, which is your NAS data, satellite imagery, pixelated data, um, manipulated, refined, interpreted. And this is what NAS data looks like um, across the, uh, you know, across an area like the state of South Dakota, where, you know, it's pixelated data. And so it allows us at, a lo at the broad scale to get pretty good information on trends or ratios of covers. But at the fine scale, it really leaves us hanging as far as interpreting um, specifically what the land use of any one area truly is. And interestingly enough, I discussed this with the guy um, at um, USDA that actually does the NAS mapping. He was one of the lead the lead mappers. And he, he said, you know, he confirmed that on the crop side, they do pretty well. On the grass side or grass-like species, it's pretty horrible, and they and they know that. Um, so not only were these land reports able to draw on mass data, but they also were able to use other public data. For instance, CRP trends. CRP is is um, addressed, you know, fairly regularly across all those types of reports. And what you see on screen um, is just uh, not only known data from 2002 to 2014. I really do apologize, folks. That's just jumping ahead of me. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but all the way through, uh, you know, projections through 2018. So we can utilize that kind of data to get an idea of what our land cover might look like across the board. For the general public, it's been concerning, of course, with the loss of grasslands. We know this. Um, and a lot of that focus on loss of CRP and then loss of uh, maybe recreational opportunity by way of or, you know, or hunting opportunity. In South Dakota, it kind of came to a head in 2013 with uh, various interpretations of what the real land use change um, that was occurring, and it spurred what was called the Governor's Pheasant Habitat Summit, focused on um, trying to come up with a set of parameters for addressing this issue, and it resulted in this uh, project in South Dakota called Habitat Pays, an opportunity to reach out to citizens and landowners for the benefit of pheasant habitat. But by and large, um, the resulting conclusion was that although there was recommendations that could be made, eh, most of it's private land, and there's not a whole lot you can do to regulate land use in that regard. So the question remains that how much remains? What 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 does the native or undisturbed or intact footprint really look like? Some organizations have tried to tackle this in various ways. Uh, World Wildlife Fund, many of you are probably familiar with their plow print project. Hey, Pete, can I break in? This is Rick. Can I break in for a minute? Uh, please mute, mute your phones, folks. Somebody's uh, not muted, and there's a lot of background noise. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to break in myself, and I'm going to see if I can get this thing to stop doing what it's doing. I apologize, folks, but it's really not letting me control when it's advancing slides. So we'll try this again from here. Um, or, sorry, we're going to go back one. Uh, so World Wildlife Fund, if you, most of you are probably familiar with their plow print. This isn't the most recent one. That's just an example where it's a cumulative um, assessment of cropping um, current history based on, on NAS data primarily. And you could they've got that at, you know, various um, regional scales. And, you know, you can you can drill down to a state assessment and get a pretty good idea of what the crop footprint looks like in any any specific time or or date stamp. Um, you can also draw um, the antithesis conclusion of that to say, okay, well if that's where the crop ground is, it's likely the intact habitat. And again, a very nice um, tool that, that's easily digestible that says, you know, this is kind of the status of the northern plains or the central plains in regard to habitat use. But 
not necessarily something that you can drill down to uh, to the field level. Um, this kind of assessment isn't new. Um, it isn't a new idea. The map you see in front of you now for South Dakota from the Nature Conservancy goes back to 2001. And again, that was just an, a, a larger national assessment of um, intact, what they called intact land, or untilled land. I want you to take a look at something, though. If you look at southeastern South Dakota and north central South Dakota, you see very little intact habitat. And as I move through my presentation, you'll see why where what we're doing sheds a little bit more light on those areas. And but again, this was what you see in front of you here is just a gross was a gross level analysis. Okay, so then we return to NAS data and what it really looks like. Now this is at the county level. Um, you can see that there's a little bit more um, refinement in the pixels, but again, it's very difficult to say for certain that this green pixel right here is actually a soybean field. It likely could be, but there's a lot of noise in this. Um, and when it comes to grass or grass-like species where the arrows are pointed, it, pointed to right now, um, you can see that there's that that's what even gets noisier. And what is going on? Okay. So in reality, these are the things that get all jumbled up in NAS data. Um, grass or grass-like species. The the six or seven categories I have here are identified as pretty hard to tell the difference from through unpixelated data. On the ground, they look quite different, but from from a satellite, they all look fairly similar. So as th the reality of what the limitations are of NAS can do, we still have many land use change reports coming out that still utilize that same data set. Good, bad, or otherwise, um, that's what's basically available publicly, and so our, our scientists are kind of forced to rely on, on those public data sets for those types of analyses. Um, so what what gets concluded from that, and, and probably accurately, is that over the course of this, in this case, a five-year span, um, grasslands accounted for about 77% of the new crop lands that were, con that were brought into production. What we don't know about this at all is what was the composition of these grasslands to begin with, especially what, comp what part of that might have been native grasslands. Okay. So I hope there's a little bit of humor here, but it's important to acknowledge what's currently happening. So those, you know, everything I've talked about so far is circa 2012-ish. And it's important to see that even though commodity prices have gone down, we are still seeing, um, you know, land conversion, maybe not at the rate that we saw it uh, previously, but if you look at the date stamps on these slides, um, you can see that it's still happening, um, and, and, and it's happening across the, uh, the landscape. Our technology has allowed us to, again, um, make it easier. Uh, we can spray out native grasslands. We can go in with a no-till drill, and in, in the year of the spray, I mean, you can spray it in the spring, and you can expect a crop in the fall. Quality of the crop may be questionable, but it's re eliminated several steps in the process of conversion at this point. Um, you know, so here we've got some technologies that are able to be applied in, in different ways. Um, but we also see the traditional continuing to happen. Central North Dakota 2016 and even some 2017 North Dakota photos. So what's driving this? It's hard to say. Um, it, can't, it can't hardly be prices uh, the way our crop prices are. So again, it leaves the question, what about the native habitats? Um, we knew that to assess native habitats, we needed a different tool. So we incorporated the Farm Service Agency's common land unit uh, data. And what the common land unit data is, is a uh, data set that reflects cr known cropping history um, circa the 1950s, but even actually took into account records from the 1930s and prior. So it is probably, arguably, the best collective record of cropping um, in the country. 
And many people know that. The problem is how to get your hands on it. It's kind of proprietary. Well, it is proprietary da data. Um, and it takes, you know, um, some luck, I guess, to, to acquire the data for this type of use. We were able to acquire the common land unit data. Again, folks, I am sorry about the jumpiness in the slides. It just keeps wanting to advance itself. Um, I am not sure why. But um, the, the, this, is a, this is the common land unit data um, for South Dakota as of 2013. So that's basically the entirety of the, known, of the recorded cropping history for South Dakota. What this data looks like and why it's different than the NAS data is that this is field level data. Um, okay, um, I just got a note here. Uh, Rick, or can you guys hear me okay? This is Rick. I can hear. I can hear you okay. Are you having any issues with? I just got a note handed to me here from my secretary that somebody called in that said that it's that every fourth word or so is not coming through. Is that is are others experiencing that? This is Pete Fassbender. I can hear you loud and clear, Pete. Okay, I think we'll go ahead with with continuing then. Um, so with with common land unit data, the reason it's different is what you'll see on this map in front of you now is that it's mapped data. It's field edges. It's actually drawn data. It's not interpreted pixelated data. So there can still be error here, but what it is is that it's mapped lines and mapped data units. So what you see on screen here is where we turned on the CLU data, the common land unit data, and applied a black shade to everything that was coded as crop ground, okay, in this, just in this small view. And you'll see that there's obviously likely other fields here that were cropped. I am so sorry, folks, for that jumping ahead. Um, these fields that were, all, were obviously cropped, but maybe weren't recorded, okay? So that's what the crux of our, of our project is tackling. So what we do is we look at the entire landscape section by section, and we remove all of the crop-coded CLU tracks, whether they're in corn or in any other kind of cover. If they've got a cropping history, they're essentially removed from the analysis, even if they're under CRP, for instance. We then look for all other uh, cropping, unrecorded cropping. Uh, we throw out industrial use, egg use, um, mining, et cetera. We continue, then we apply some our, any agency data that we might have that would help us refine the landscape. We remove large water bodies over 40 acres. And I can address that in the Q&A section if someone's got a question on that, that step. But ultimately, what we're left with is land by order of deduction that is likely native or undisturbed. Um, I want to make that point. You can't look at aerial photography and say something is native, but you can look at aerial photography say so, and, and say with reasonable assurance that something is not native. So it's an order of deduction. The final thing then we apply is a permanent land protection assessment. Um, with partner data, we've been able to build a pretty comprehensive um, uh, coverage of permanent protection, which is agency fee title owned or east or permanent easement. Okay, so that big question is what is not undisturbed? Um, the three primary categories that we're looking for when we're throwing out land, uh, egg disturbance or cultivation, residential disturbance, or like I said, industrial disturbance. I'm not going to go through this entire list. Um, so to date, we've assessed eastern South Dakota and portions of southwest Minnesota with this methodology. Um, and I'm just going to run through some results for you. It's, it, there's a lot of them here, I'm, so I just want to kind of get you the, the feel of what it is that we've been able to accomplish with this analysis. So, for instance, in the Prairie Coteau region of southwest Minnesota, which is south of this blue line, about 8.2% of the land is, is likely undisturbed. 
And if we take that and we put it in a pie chart of that 8.2%, about 17% of that is actually protected, which means that about 1.3% of that landscape is both native and protected. I hope that's clear. Um, if we go to the Lacaparo region of Minnesota, the same analysis applies, about 8.7% native. And of that, a, a larger chunk is protected in that region. That's You get up into around Big Stone, Lacaparo, et cetera. Um, I'm sorry, this is jumping ahead again. But interestingly, then you get along the Minnesota River here, much less protected, and only a very small sliver is actually protected and native. Um, when we look at the entirety of that southwest Minnesota landscape that we did analyze, about 8% is undisturbed or native, and about 2.1% um, is both undisturbed and protected. So a pretty small portion of that of that landscape, you know, that's nicknamed kind of the Black Desert, and uh, and you know you can see why. Um, on the Missouri Coteau of South Dakota, the same type of analysis. I'm going to um, just run through these. So this is the Central Missouri Coteau, about 41% undisturbed. A pretty good chunk of it is protected. Um, if we look at the Missouri River Slope, which is over here along the Missouri, that that landscape, 33% or so undisturbed, and a much smaller portion, only 10% of that undisturbed land is protected. And if we look at the James River Slope, which is this portion over here, we if we look at that, about uh, you know 28% undisturbed, and a little bit again higher on the protection scale. Um, and those are all primarily Fish and Wildlife Service easements in that country. So when we look at the eastern South Dakota area as a whole, this is kind of what the, the final culmination of all the data looks like, is that about 73% of that landscape has a proven disturbance history. The flip side is that about 5.5 million acres, or 24.5%, is likely intact which is higher than I really thought it would be, actually. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Um, you know, that number, I thought it would be lower than that, honestly. Uh, if we dig into that number a little bit more, uh, we'll see that the vast majority of all the undisturbed land is grass, um, and about 2.1% is woodlands. So there is some woodlands in eastern South Dakota. And this map of Roberts County uh, kind of highlights that. Sorry. Jumping on me again. Um, you can see in green, those are our native woodlands. And the brownish color is your intact native grasslands. And then over here on the left, you'll see that things we can rank all counties against each other, both by by actual acres or percentages or whatever we might like to do. Um, so, in, e all, in the entirety of eastern South Dakota, this is really interesting. About 4.3% of the land is undisturbed and protected. I'm going to move up here a little bit, and I want to show you two other numbers. So about 17.5% of all of the undisturbed land that's available, which is about 5.5 million acres, about 17.5% of that is actually protected. So there's a lot of work to do in regard to protecting the remainder of those undisturbed lands. But what's interesting is you got to take your hat off to organizations like Fish and Wildlife Service and others, because this is a pretty nice number. Of all the protected land that's out there where we've made protection investments, about 70% shows to be native. So um, you know, seven out of ten acres that are being invested into are, are show that we likely are putting our money in the right spot in regard to conservation. Um, I'm going to skip that one. We can look at we can look at counties individually. Uh, Buffalo County, South Dakota, one of our highest total acres and percentage of intact, um, potentially undisturbed land, but it falls down. 
dramatically in regard to the protection um, of that land. It's only about 4% protected. This is the, basically the home grounds of the uh, Crow Creek uh, uh, tribal lands. So is it eminently threatened? Probably not, um, but, but it, does, it does not have legal protection per se. And along that same theme, we've got the, the state of South Dakota owned lands, which I'm going to show you here now. Um, South Dakota state, uh, Game, Fish, and Parks and School and Public Lands owns just over 1.1 million acres of land in South Dakota. Um, if we look at this little highlighted area, um, and there's kind of this Four Corners region, it's pretty interesting. Um, right there, they own 25,000 acres of land. Legally, we've had to remove um, the state-owned lands from our protection category because as we've looked into this and discussed with state officials, there is no legal obligation that those lands will remain intact. Now, again, they're not eminently threatened from conversion, but there's nothing in statute or legislatively that says that um, those, those agencies um, necessarily could not convert that land for some other use. Now, the reality is they probably won't, but we had to stick with our legal interpretations. Um, so what can we provide? Well, like in eastern South Dakota, what you see in front of you now is just a county chart with more categories than you probably care to know. But we've really broken this down to analyze just about every aspect of land use based on those county on a county by county basis. So now I go back to our overall statewide CLU map and I overlay our map. And at first glance, they don't look much different. And you probably are wondering, is this all worth the effort um, just to refine that CLU data? And I can tell you that I think it is uh, very much worth the effort. And here's why. We may, when we look at the crop land, the the seventy percent of crop of the landscape that's crop, we've only refined that by like ten percent. But if we actually look at our understanding of native or intact lands, we refine that by over thirty percent by going through our analysis. That helps us. That helps all of us as scientists know that we're working with a tool that's more accurate than what we've ever had in the past. Um, but it is really important to understand and remember that we're not doing a quality assessment here. Uh, we can't tell you the, va the, the quality of those lands that fall into that native or undisturbed category. <clears throat> so that's important. Um, we can, however, though, apply, because this is all GIS based, what I've got in front of you now is a, a map of Bailey's ecoregions for eastern South Dakota. And if we look at, I'm going to look at ecoregion 18 here, the Missouri Coteau, and just kind of walk you through a quick analysis. So what can our data do to help us understand land use and, uh, and conservation planning, for instance? Well, we can look at that area. I've got circled there. And we know what it looks like on the ground, pretty much intact grasslands for the most part on the high country. Um, we can apply our data, and now you can see the, where the intact grasslands occur throughout that small landscape. And you can see all these streams that basically originate from that intact grassland. Well, then the next question is how much of that might be protected? And again, uh, a pretty good chunk of that, those stream headwaters are protected through permanent easements. So again, it's a nice analysis tool. This is what that might look like on the ground. Um, where you've got a stream originating in, originating in a protected grassland flowing out onto crop ground. We can also look at it at the ranch level. This is just a hypothetical ranch that I made up, but I wanted to show the utility of, of our data in something as simple as Google Earth. You can import the shape files right into Google Earth, and so now I can sit down with a rancher in anywhere in eastern South Dakota and discuss how their land let them draw their own boundary, and then we can discuss what, how their land looks in regard to intact, potentially native, as well as if there's any easement or permanent protection within the ranch boundary. We can also do something like overlaying the streams to help them have a better idea of their ecological impact 
um, in their in their area or their neighborhood, you know, as you see on this map here. Again, then we, it also gives us an opportunity to talk to that landowner about the quality on the ranch. You know, we can't tell them what the quality is from the map, but it might it, it might initiate further conversation for assessing quality on the ground. <clears throat> okay, so the co common land unit is kind of the holy grail of data, but it also has its limitations, and it's important that we don't um, um, criticize it too much because it was never intended for what we're using it for. And one of the things that it misses is go back land. Um, this thing is getting a little jumpy on me again, but go back land is land that has previously been cropped some time ago and has gone back, you know, in quotes, to some more native or natural state. Sometimes through um, through natural succession, uh, repopulation of native plants. Other times, just simply by um, more uh, uh, focused replanting or intentional replanting. And these things are indicated by certain things like rocks or, you know, obviously sometimes they're hay fields or old foundations. There's there's sometimes there's pretty good indicators, dead furrows, etc., but not always. And so we're very diligent about looking for those indicators and mapping those properties separately. We retain these as labeled as go back land because Unless we can absolutely prove that they were tilled, we are very conservative and keep them in the undisturbed land layer unless or until we can prove otherwise. And it's just kind of a, a conservative approach. Um, so you will see in, in the next couple of slides that there is, that, so our undisturbed land layer is not perfect. Um, it's quite good, but it's not perfect. And here you'll see that we did not assess go back land on the Prairie Coteau when we were first starting it during the pilot. We did assess it at a course level on the Missouri Coteau. And then we refined our assessment protocols through central South Dakota and we'll continue that going westward into western South Dakota. So this has been a big learning experience for us too. Um, where this gets kind of real is on Say, for instance, federal land, this is the Grand River National Grasslands in Perkins County, South Dakota. Um, a great deal of easily defined go-back land with almost no CLU cropping history associated with it. This field up here in the central portion in black has a cropping history. Um, the rest of these are on the national grasslands. Obvious fields, but no cropping history, so we have to define those. And again, we look for indicators um, that they're likely go back. Here you've got a foundation. Um, and we can see a lot of this stuff through aerial imagery as well. Um, the other thing with the CLU data is that it's kind of fluid. Um, when, a, when land changes use and goes from crop land to some developed state, so maybe you built a farm site or a, or a town, on old crop ground, ground, they will likely recategorize that from crop to non-crop. And uh, that's not that big a deal because we can see a town, we can see a barn, we can see a house, and so we can, we can easily throw that out. What becomes difficult is when they re-identify and recategorize land that has been purchased or otherwise protected and taken out of crop production. And this is quite haphazard, and it doesn't happen all the time. But, for instance, in some counties, they've gone ahead and they've recategorized old crop ground where, say, Fish and Wildlife Service has put an easement on it, and then now they've called it non-crop. And the cropping record is essentially gone. It's essentially because the, the common land unit is a, um, a fluid database. They don't time stamp it very well. Um, and so it does get rolled up to a national level database of annually or so. But let's just say it's a little cumbersome to work through it on an annual basis. So this poses somewhat of a problem um, where we've got land that's changed use and then the cropping history um, gets erased or goes away. Uh, an example of that is here we've got Danvers WMA in Minnesota. 
if you just applied the CLU data, you would assume that all of this is native, intact habitat, when in reality, Minnesota DNR has provided us information that clearly states otherwise. Everything in red has a known cropping history. So we refine our data based on partner data as much as we can get. And so those of you that have provided us data for this, very much uh, want to thank you because it's helped refine the process a great deal. The other thing to understand about CLU data is that Farm Service Agency allows landowners to enroll land out of county. This is a good example. This is Brown County, South Dakota. And this is all the land that's enrolled in Brown County, South Dakota. And you can see that there's land in other counties all around Brown County that are enrolled in Brown County, South Dakota. And all the way over to Campbell County and even land in North Dakota up there. I wish that would go away. Um, so for instance, if I was to look at the CLU coverage in Marshall County, without turning on Brown County, I would have holes. In, in the data everywhere that those, those acres occur. So to buffer that, we went from a pilot study to requesting CLU data for the entire state to needing a seven state CLU data just to cover South Dakota and the perimeters so that we were sure to be able to work around the edges. What that looks like more blown up is this is uh, Harding and Perkins County in South Dakota. Everything that you see in red is missing CLU data that we simply could not find in North Dakota or any of the surrounding states. So where that land may or may not be enrolled is, is forever unknown. Um, CLU also isn't perfect over time. Um, we found that in this case, our 2013 CLU data showed that these fields were cropped, but they showed no cropping history on these fields, which was clearly cropped. So when we went back and turned on the 2005 data, it shows that they were clearly cropped. And then we identified that, uh, that there were, in 2011, they did a little bit of tweaking on their coding. And there were some fields that simply lost their crop history. Now, fortunately, again, we can see this. We can easily see this from aerial imagery. And, you, and so we don't feel like we're missing many of these. But again, it gives you. Gives, I'm trying to help you understand why you can't just take CLU at face value and assume that what's not recorded as crop ground is native ground. Um, you have to go through this refinement process. Sometimes they're mapped inaccurately. Sometimes an edge is missed, like what you'll see here. Um, sometimes they're, they're coded and mapped, and then it seems like it's just human error. This is all recorded as cropping, when in reality, a great deal of it is still intact, likely untilled grassland, if you follow my arrow. Same with this ranch here, um, coded as the entire thing coded as crop, when in reality, there is no cropping history indicators on that ranch. So the reason I point this out is that some folks, I'm sorry, some folks have wanted to use our data as kind of the um, benchmark uh, for program building, and I think it's an absolutely valid tool. But in this case, if you can imagine, if you were this producer and you were applying for some kind of a um, uh, point system program that said, well, if your land is native or if you can prove that it's intact, uh, you'll get six or 10 or 12 extra points on your program application. Well, if we look at, if, if we would take the CLU at face value, that person would have been kicked out of the program or wouldn't have gotten their points. And so we happen to find this one, but you know, there's, there is potential that there's others that we're not finding because what we're doing is we're turning on the CLU data as our first, our first um, analysis point. So there's, so that's something to keep in mind. And so I think I would caution you that our data is going to be very, very valuable, but it shouldn't be the sole source of decision making. I guess that's my point. Um, going forward, we are, we've completed Eastern South Dakota. We're nearly complete with this northern corner of South, of South Dakota. And these counties here, oh, I do apologize, everyone. These counties here are, are in the process of preliminary mapping. We hope to be done within about 
a year or so if we can continue to secure funding. Um, the northwest corner of South Dakota, about close to 80 percent intact from what we can prove at this point. Um, that area has its own unique challenges. It's large. There's a lot of different land um, use histories. Uh, these clay pans are, are predominant in some regions. Um, you've got, you know, some salinity issues, and so these things all show up on satellite imagery, as do some mysteries or initial mysteries. We started to see this pattern in certain areas of uh, of Butte and Harding counties, and we were baffled as to what it really was. We didn't know if it was um, photographic reflection or if it was truly land use. We did some digging and we did find that in most cases these are historic rangeland improvement patterns that have since, you know, over the decades have kind of healed. But this is what they have done in those western rangelands in places, um, plowed or deep ripped for water infiltration in, in, in the hopes of additional um, forage production. In many cases it did result in forage production. But you certainly can't call this undisturbed native land, but it's also not crop ground, although sometimes it did look, it did look like crop ground. But it was allowed to revegetate naturally. So we are calling these areas, and when we're seeing them, we're flagging them. You can see the difference between what was ripped and what wasn't ripped there. Um, I'm sorry, here. You can see the difference. And so these edges, these fields, we're calling, um, we're simply calling them rangeland improvement. Now, I would disagree maybe with the term improvement, but um, it's a technical term that everyone's comfortable with. And then you can also see the natural patterns on the landscape at times, and we have to be careful of, of how we assess those. Um, this slide, if you look at it, you can see this checkered pattern here. That's, again, some type of disturbance likely with a roller or aerator. And so there's, there's a lot of fuzziness sometimes into how we interpret these things. And so we're just categorizing these as something different. And for conservation planning purposes, it may not be all that significant. I'm sorry. Um, it may not be all that significant because, uh, you know, does that change your interpretation of the value of that land for conservation or protection? Maybe not. Um, does it change the microclimates or maybe its appeal to certain species, whether they be generalists or specialists? Possibly. You know, so it's just a, it's a category that we're making sure we capture. Once in a while we'll get lucky enough and we'll see the tool out in the field, and in this case it was simply a uh, harrow. They were probably harrowing down cow pies from the previous year. We're marking these things, we're keeping track of them, and we hope to incorporate them in a future um, project phase where we incorporate LIDAR. Uh, South Dakota NRCS is trying to complete LIDAR for the entire state. We've done some initial runs. So what you see here is fields that we initially called uh, crop ground. Uh, with aerial imagery. Now you've got this nice LIDAR image and it actually shows that we missed a couple. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that LIDAR really does for us. Uh, here you've got the fields identified. I'm sorry. Uh, you got the fields identified, but LIDAR helps us pick the actual true edges. So it's it's pretty interesting uh, opportunity to apply LIDAR, but at this point we don't have the funding to do that. Um, uh, also going forward, we hope to have a better handle on our on our cedar encroachment. Um, this is the Green Glacier, and uh, we've mapped in some areas uh, that we've completed you know, our closed canopy. We're also very interested in the open canopy and how much time we have until these areas become closed to canopy. Uh, we're working with South Dakota State University, um, Dr. Wimberly, and, and a graduate student by the name of Kyle Kasky to work on this mapping project and this predictive modeling. Um, the objective there is to hopefully create a tool that can be applied to the landscape, and they're using Landsat 8 imagery uh, overlaid on a, I'm sorry, on a four-county area for the ground truthing and an analysis for that project. 
So we hope that that yields a reasonable tool, modeling tool for the rest of the state and the region. Dr. Wimbler has also looked at something really unique in regard to connectivity. And what you see in front of you is a map of the Prairie Coteau of South Dakota. And if you're, you know, just to kind of wrap your head around this, let's say you're a prairie skink or you're a badger or you're a, a, uh, a butterfly or something that, you know, let's say you can move a thousand meters. Um, you're, and so you can, you can, you can take advantage of corridors um, that allow, that move across a thousand meters of connectivity. Pretty much the entire landscape is available to you. But if you can only tolerate a 500 meter gap in your connectivity, um, about half the landscape drops off. If you can only tolerate a 50 meter gap, look at the Look at how much landscape you don't have available to you, even on the Prairie Coteau, which is one of our hotbeds of, uh, of intact grasslands. So this is going to be a pretty important paper that Mike is working on. Um, also, we've worked with Aeros Data Center, and they are working on a project called LC Map. And what LC Map does is use, it goes back to satellite data, and it maps the history of these pixels. And you can see how over time they've, you can, they've got these distinct patterns that correlate with land use history, cropping, hayfield, conversion, and now it's a developed town. And this is a really neat project, except for that it only goes back to the mid-80s. So its applicability in what we're doing isn't all that great. But um, we hope to be able to help them truth their data based on our work in western South Dakota, which aligns well with one of their truthing stations. Um, so I'm going to wrap here. This is uh, why this is important. It's important for our future to understand our land and our land use history. Uh, our final products that are available free from download from South Dakota State is geodatabase shapefiles, our reports, charts, maps, etc. Those can be accessed through our iGrow website. And uh, even more completely, they can be accessed through South Dakota State University's Open Prairie website. And you'll see here that all of the files are available for download, the geodatabase, shape files, charts, maps, etc. So in closing, it's interesting here, and again, I am not, I'm not picking on anyone, but we, we tend to fall into the idea of no net loss. And this is, a, this is on a World Wildlife Fund pamphlet. I'm certain the intention here is not to advocate that you can trade out a, prairie, a piece of prairie for a piece of prairie. But the reality is that the public, I think, interprets this very similar to how we talked about wetlands. And I'm not sure that no net loss really worked well for wetlands, and I'm certain it really doesn't work well for grasslands, because we cannot get back this 90% of biodiversity and biomass and life that we lose when we plow it down. And uh, so no net loss probably does not work as a policy for grasslands, um, and I think we have to be cognizant of that. I'd like to thank the partners. There's, there's many, too many to thank individually, but uh, their support has been phenomenal, and their support going forward is exceptional as well. So we hope to be able to wrap this. And I'll leave you with just some funny things that we've seen from aerial imagery. Uh, misspelled happy birthday. Uh, that one just says hi. Some kind of twist on Van Halen, I'm not sure. Um, nice message, God loves you. And then we don't know what this one is. Um, we haven't found Stonehenge yet. Somebody really likes Yamaha, though. So with that, I'm going to wrap here, and I think we're on time for questions and answers. I apologize for the skippiness in the um, presentation. I'm not really sure what happened there, but... With that, I don't know, um, either Rick, should I hand it back over, or? Um, you? Yep, um, you can hand it back over to Rick if you'd like, or you can keep, yeah, actually, why don't you keep it for the, the duration of the question and answer? Trying to, trying to figure out how do I keep it. Um, should I be able to see, I imagine you all are seeing what I'm seeing, uh, call in user 16 screen. in the middle, is that right? Are you no, seeing that? No, we don't see that. 
No, we're seeing a screen that says, or I am, this is Rick says, thanks for using Cisco WebEx. WebEx. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing that as well. Okay. Um, I don't see any uh, uh, chat box or anything like that. We have nothing in the chat box. We've got quite a few people on the line today, and so um, I'll just, but I'll just think we'll give it a shot here. If somebody has a question, just uh, unmute and ask the question, and then maybe just remute the phone afterwards. So uh, um, I'm just going to open it up for questions now. All right, I'll start. This is Rick to get the ball rolling. So, Pete, you mentioned early on in your presentation the 40-acre wetland. Um, and so explain that for us, would you? Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, we felt it was really important not to, you know, we it is the prairie pothole region. Um, it's not the prairies and potholes region, you know. So when we talk about native land um, or undisturbed land, you know, to, to remove the water from that system just seems asinine. Um, but also we recognize that if we didn't have some type of parameter in there um, that we would maybe artificially be inflating our intact native grassland um, numbers. And I think you can appreciate that. You know, you get some of these larger prairie lakes that are, you know, sections in size, and it could, um, it could influence that. So we looked at the, at South Dakota, we are, we've got the water layer from the state of South Dakota and it was pretty, 40 acres seemed like a pretty happy medium to under 40 acres, those basins are included in our intact undisturbed land layer. Above 40 acres, uh, they were removed as large water. Um, and then the other thing that we, we also did is that even in crop ground, um, we took a hard look at basins that were in crop ground that were likely intact or that were surrounded by crop ground. And if they were less than 40 acres and had a reasonable habitat edge around them, and and so of course if they were had been farmed through in the past, the CLU layer would have covered that anyway and we would have thrown them out. But if they had not been farmed through in the past and were retained, uh, we would take a hard look at those and if they met the criteria, they would be included in the uh, undisturbed land layer. Um, does that make sense? I know that's a little convoluted. But yeah, thanks Thanks for sharing that, Pete. That does make sense. Okay. Is there anyone else with a question out there? Hey, Pete, this is Sean Fields with the PPJV. I'm interested in uh, <clears throat> in hearing the, the time frame it took to complete where we're at right now and, and the uh, technician staffing for the, for the digitizing needed and then the NAEP imagery. Um, when I started, I was playing high school football, and now I've got a walker. No, <laughs> no uh, it's taken us, we started the project in 2014 with the pilot project. And so you'll see the timestamps on this as, um, and I, I, I failed to mention this, um, one of the objectives I wanted to, to hit with this project was we needed a benchmark for native grass, or native um, lands, so that we could, unfortunately, in the future, be able to assess conversion of native lands. There's never been a benchmark set, so when we talk about these conversion ratios, it's really fuzzy, you know. So we we picked at the time in 2014 the most recent uh, CLU data that was available, which was 2013 data, and the most recent NAEP imagery, which was 2012 NAEP. And so even here in 2017, we're continuing to use those two years, the 2013 CLU, the 2012 NAEP imagery. When, and so when we complete that, so now we, we intend to complete it with the, you know, the, within 2017 or 2018. And if you think about this, we'll be able to then return immediately with new NAEP imagery and new CLU data if we can get it, but even if we can't, it isn't that big of a deal because we've reduced the landscape that we need to look at by so much by throwing out the CLU that we will be able to turn around and within short order be able to give you all a change parameter. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? 
It does. So yep. We'll be able to compare our 2012, 2013 timestamp with a 2017 or 2020 timestamp and put some numbers behind loss of native grasslands. Unfortunately, you know, this all should have been done 30 years ago, but it, it wasn't, you know. And what about staffing? How many folks did you have uh, helping you out with this project? I've got two technicians that have been on. Uh, we, we've always had about two technicians going from mid-2014 when we started. Um, and uh, right now there, I've got, we started with some contractors on the pilot with the Prairie Coteau since uh, the beginning of 20. Uh, since mid mid 2015, yeah. So it'll be it'll be about two years in August that we will have had these our two te primary techs on. I've got a lead tech and a an assistant tech, and honestly, those are the guys that do all the work. I keep the I keep the wheels turning, but um, so two full time staff working on it, you know, 40 hours a week. Thank you. So it. Uh, to follow up with that, it is pretty, it is pretty, you know, considered labor intensive, kind of. But I look at what we're accomplishing, and I think of how much labor has gone into all the other reports combined that have only been able to bring us to some. I mean, they've been good, but you know, I don't think our labor cost is really all that much when I when I assess it because we're we're still under. Oh, we're, we'll be under, I think. Less than four hundred thousand when it's all said and done, which you know it's not cheap, but it's not it's it's not expensive in regard to some other projects. Um, well, I see we're almost at the top of the hour. Are there any uh, final questions for Pete? I've got a general question I'd like to throw out to the group if there's still some folks on, and and that is. Given what you've seen, I know we kind of blasted through it a little bit quickly. Is it replicable in your state? Um, is it is it replicable in North Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, um, Canada? Can and should the same thing be done um, in other areas? Is there enough value there? Um, and so I'd love to hear comment and feedback on that. This is Sean Fields again. Certainly from a JV perspective, I think it's extremely valuable um, uh, in all the states. And, and I'm, I sit in Montana and, and see it. Uh, see it can, certainly those methods can be used here as well. Um, that's ex exactly why I asked you about staffing and, and the economics of it all time-wise and funding to, to, to think about the feasibility of expansion. But, yeah, I, I certainly think there's a lot of the value here. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah, that's Todd Frex at Audubon in North Dakota. And <clears throat> definitely think it's important for uh, targeting our easement acquisition and uh, showing the, the urgency and the importance of moving forward with more easement funding. I appreciate that. I've uh, I've often I've often wondered is is there a, is a is it a better future for each state to tackle this individually or for a centralized, you know, because you can do Montana sitting in Minnesota. You know, you, you you don't have to be in state, but sometimes the partner relationships, I think, you know, I guess my career of getting to know partners and stuff has helped tremendously in, in building the trust necessary to ask for the data sets that we've asked for. Um, but I don't think that's unique to me. And so I'm 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 thinking that I, I I wrestle with the idea that if this was a Great Plains wide effort, could we manage it out of a single central repository? And then I think you know I, I go down the line of wouldn't it be cool if biologists then or or those people on the ground could and could submit corrections and then maybe annually. Um, we refine and publish, a, you know, a corrected uh, geodatabase that says, well, hey, you know, they got this, they got this polygon wrong. That's actually not native, or maybe this one is native, and you, you know, you have this kind of uh, continually refined um, best information type of repository. 
I really don't know where the appropriate place for that to be housed or managed it would be, but it's something to think about. Pete, I have a, a question. I hope it's not too late to ask this question. Sure. You, you keep referring to native. Um, have, have you been able to do any ground truthing of these areas to find out if, if you really have native grasses in these areas or they're just undisturbed? Just, and I asked a question just, you mentioned different states here in North Dakota. We have a lot of our native prairie invaded by Kentucky bluegrass. So would that show up as, as native in your database? That's a great question. I really appreciate you asking that. I do tend to, to um, use both terms maybe um, to my own fault. So undisturbed is really what I'm talking about. No no proof of disturbance history, which in, in the very very sense of that means no proof of iron in the ground, okay? So that's our baseline. That's why this is really called an undisturbed land analysis. Um, by uh, common sense, you would say, well, that would mean that it's likely native sod, undisturbed, right? It doesn't mean that it's of any quality grade. Um, so if it's invaded by Kentucky bluegrass, if it's never been disturbed but has been horribly managed and, say, grazed out, sprayed out, cowed out, whatever, and is now all 100% Kentucky bluegrass, it still will show up in our assessment as undisturbed land. Okay. So your question about ground truthing is really, really valid. And, um, you know, it's not it's very similar to other questions I get all the time is you know the, the next question is then why aren't we ground truthing and so we have to remember that we are setting the baseline for others to be able to have something tangible to work off of to go out and ground truth um, and that's my best answer so you could take uh, you could take our undisturbed layer now and you could apply if you wished the Minnesota biological um, county biological survey criteria and, and rank those undisturbed lands as far as their quality. Or you could apply any other methodology that you wanted to score or rank those lands. Um, but no, by no means does it mean that they're all of high quality. Um, um, you know, and, and Broman bluegrass would be the, probably the top of the list of culprits. And Thank a lot you. of them are hay. A lot of them are hay prairie, you know, hay ground as well. So there's, yeah. you know, there's uh, there's noise in this, you know. Um. And and one one other question: sure. Have have you thought about incorporating some soils or maybe ecological site description data into this database to figure out if some of these undisturbed protected areas fall mostly within the same the soils, ecological site types, and that's the reason they're undisturbed and protected. So maybe uh, figuring out, uh, like, no, uh, like they might be reduced habitat diversity because they're all in a sandy ecological site with a slope of more than 50% or something like that. No, we have not. No. Again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll fall back on my last answer is that, um, you know, we can't, that can't really be done until this gets done, but that's okay. got a tremendous amount of value. I think, you know, when we started on the Prairie Coteau, it was so obvious. You know, it's like if it's that steep, it didn't get plowed, you know, right? Yeah. But then I show, then you saw the pictures that I showed you and saying that, you know, any more rocks and topography and those types of things um, uh, don't necessarily carry the weight for non-cropping that they used to. So I think, you know, in that question of assessment, um, you surely could do soils and ecological types and slopes and things like that. But I think also for that to be a very complete analysis, you'd almost have to look at social cultural trends. Um, you know, why are some of these areas unplowed? Um, was it because the because they recognize very clearly the the best and highest use of that land or or, or you know who knows? So there's, there, I think there's it's a both and, but I think that looking at that would be really interesting. Um, I don't anticipate that we will be do, able to do that, but I would, you know, I'll add that to my list of of 
you know, offshoots that I would love, I would love for anybody, and I guess that's what I'd like to close my comments with is this data is out there now free for you all to pick from, choose from, uh, use it, um, play around with it, apply assessments to it. You know, it's, um, it's all free for the pickings. So I'd love, and I would love to hear back from you on how you might be applying it in conservation planning or land use assessments or anything else. Well, we're about seven minutes after the hour, and so I'm going to take this opportunity. Pete, thank you so much for that presentation, uh, kind of a, an informative overview on the investigation and classification of the remaining native lands in South Dakota. I really appreciate you coming on the webinar today. Oh, I thank appreciate so it. Sorry for the technical glitches. No worries. I'd like to thank everybody for participating, and uh, I think we're going to bring this one to a close. I'll see you all next time. Thank you all.